Um, okay, I introduced myself. My name is Thomas Kern. Um, you might think that doesn't sound very English. And it, in fact, it is not. You know, Kern is a very unusual name in the United Kingdom. I, I moved to United Kingdom in 2007 from Germany. I grew up uh, in South Bavaria. Um, and um, various British companies wanted me to come over to United Kingdom. And since 2009, I practiced um, in the Building Schools for the Future scheme. From 2009 onwards, I practiced at Newcastle University as a teacher. My areas of expertise are educational architecture and uh, sustainable design. Now, um, what you see here is Newcastle University. Um, it is a quite um, let's say, solid university, but it is a very good ranking. You see one image of Newcastle upon Tyne. Newcastle upon Tyne um, is very different to St. Petersburg. Um, it has a quite long-ranging history, but it's so much smaller. Uh, it has only 300,000 citizens, but it has a very strong heritage. You know, the Romans had the, the Hadrian's Wall, uh, then there were Celtic settlements, uh, it was very important in the war with the Scottish, uh, that's the name for, the reason for the name, New Castle. That was the castle, actually the last bigger fortification in front of the Scottish border. Um, New Castle University itself is a, a rather traditional university, so with all the old classic subjects like law, all science subjects, it's excellent in uh, biology and medicine, it's also very strong in architecture. And uh, my role at Newcastle University is I'm the specialist for internationals in architecture. I've got my own department. Um, I'm the head of this department. I've got 10 uh, tutors, teachers on uh, my team. And I've got currently 80 students on the program from all around the world. Uh, I've got also about 10 students from Russia. Um, what I want to do, I want to show you before we jump in the actual subject, which is memory and architecture, I want to show you uh, one of my last projects, a school building, because it has to do with the subject of memory. What you see here um, is Harvard Technology College, which I uh, finished in 2012. To the left hand side, you see an older traditional uh, school building built in the 1930s. It's a very beautiful building. It, is, it has many of these qualities we appreciate so much. It has oak flooring, has very high ceilings, nice big windows. And now the authority, the school authority, thought possibly we demolish it and build everything new, because it's so much easier. You know, sometimes uh, if you start a refurbishment of a building, you don't know what you have to expect in future costs. Now, after long discussion with uh, the government, we could convince them to keep the old building and just build a new part to it. And so what we wanted to create was actually a new interpretation of a secondary school and a kind of a dialogue between both and uh, also an educational boulevard. So basically a conscious decision to keep the memory. So if you have a family, possibly your granddad already went to the school and the memory of your granddad is still uh, alive. I show you then a little bit how this uh, project uh, developed inside, so this is uh, basically the concept. It is a relatively traditional setup, so we've got a middle corridor, which is nothing new. We've got a large dining area. The reason for the large dining area is this school is in a relatively deprived area. Uh, Newcastle was famous for shipbuilding, heavy industries, all these jobs are gone. So there are in part families which are uh, the second generation without work. 
And what we wanted to do with this school is actually to give a lot to the children, to the students, that they like it. Now, the concept is very, very easy to see. So we've got in the middle area the large dining center, which it can be hired for venues and so on. We've got a sixth floor, which is, I think, equivalent to your year 10 and 11. Um, and that is pretty open, so there are open teaching spaces in there. And at the end, we've got the uh, teacher spaces. And these elements are glazed, so the students can look inside whether the teachers are working, and at the same time, of course, the teachers can know whether everything is all right on the corridor. And very quickly, they jump into the building. So this is the entrance area, the uh, sixth form center, and um, what we wanted to give to these children is we wanted to show them appreciation. Very often, you know, young people felt left behind, in particular in a deprived area. And we wanted to show that they are important. So we designed something which is between a hotel and a university. So something which is relaxed and which is enjoyable so that you really say, even if I don't like the teacher, at least I like the building. Of course, we all loved our teachers already. So we implemented a few uh, plants over here, and, um, and this is then the old building which we refurbished. It has a very, for uh, a, a, a secondary school, a quite large main hall with 600 seats. And there are elements of memory. What you can see here are the war memorial flags, left and right, so from the First and the Second World War. Now I move on to the actual uh, uh, subject for tonight. So I change the slideshow. And the mouse is gone. Ah, there it is. Okay. It's all fine. And that's fine. Now, um, it's quite a time uh, since it, the idea of memory in architecture touches me and moves me. I gave a talk uh, at the Gazoo uh, about delete it or keep it, which was about the brutalist architecture, the modernist architecture, which is such a difficult thing to cope with, you know. It's not necessarily nice. And uh, very often, these buildings just disappear. But we don't want to talk about this subject tonight. So um, I made a very conscious image here because I think keeping memory is not always that easy. You know, sometimes memories drop out. We want to remember something. Um, and uh, sometimes we need a special method that we keep things in mind. And what I did here, you know, I made a, actually a butter stain on this page that I can remember what I read. And that is an essay about the Frauenkirche in Dresden, which is one of these interesting symbols in history. Uh, does anybody know this building, Frauenkirche Dresden? It's a very beautiful Baroque building, which was uh, uh, bombed, of course, in the war. And the heaps of rubble were a monument for many times. And this building was rebuilt uh, in parts with these old buildings, uh, with, with these old um, elements. And okay, now it's moving on. Oops, it's low. Now, um, what enhanced now my interest um, of memory? was one of my leisure activities. This is an area where I love to cycle. So I'm cycling somewhere along here, nice path over here. And what you see here is a very interesting building. This is an old um, uh, psychiatric uh, asylum, so a psychiatric hospital, uh, in a beautiful forest area. Now, uh, inside, this is a derelict building, so it was not used anymore. It um, was out of use since 1988. Uh, and we see here one of the chapel spaces. 
And I think this is a space with a very special quality and special atmosphere. And then we have another space. As an architect, or you don't need an architect to be an architect to see, this is a space with a lot of quality. Very exciting. I would love to have my studio in there. And then this beautiful main hall, we still see the stage and the curtains. The light is coming in high, which is actually ideal for uh, such a setup. But unfortunately, what happened last year, the whole complex is demolished. And now it's very difficult, of course. It is a, it is a difficult question. How much of old buildings can we keep and maintain? And what should we do with it? Should we keep this memory? Should we appreciate um, the architecture? And what I find so sad about this particular uh, thing is, um, so of course it was an asylum, it was a hospital, and yes, it is difficult to give a hospital a different use. However, we've seen it had unique spaces, really uh, spaces you don't have in the region. Now, what I find so sad it is getting replaced with standard housing. So, and as a, someone, if you love nice spaces, if you love inspirational spaces, that is not that inspiring, you know. And so that triggered my, uh, my uh, imagination to, to further think about it. And I believe that in your native country, the, uh, the, this must be actually a quite important subject too. You know, what should we do with our uh, memory, with our older architecture? Now, um, I had the opportunity now, it's my fifth time to be in Russia, and I uh, saw some of the, uh, your larger cities. I was in Chelyabinsk, in Perm, in Ekaterinburg, Krasnodar, Kazan, uh, that's about it. And uh, Petersburg, obviously, the pearl always on the journey, and Moscow. Now, in Ekaterinburg, my guide told me that many of these old, uh, as you say in architecture, vernacular buildings, so native buildings are disappearing. Uh, sometimes uh, on a legal way and sometimes in a less legal way. So possibly, you know, obviously it's a timber structure and it burns very well, so they are just disappearing. And, um, and it, I think we had an interesting discussion about this image yesterday, you know, because it is actually now in a strange context, surrounded by apartment houses, uh, high-rise buildings, which are possibly okay, I don't know the quality. And now it's the big question. We need apartments, we need more flats, but what should we do with this building? Should it make place for it, or should we keep it? Um, and I show you another image uh, of a building which is totally different. But once again, the question, does anybody know this building? I find it really astonishing. Um, because when I showed this image at our own university, all the architects said, wow, that is great. We love it. Yes, you know, they love modern architecture and brutalism and all evil stuff. Um, now, uh, I think you can guess the function of this building. What do you think, what, what is the function of it? It's a water tower. And that is the white tower of Ekaterinburg. And uh, it, is, it, it is a typical constructivist structure. But I think it, as such, it is actually... Um, really uh, very special, very unique. You don't have many of these standing. You, you know, if I think about some of your culture centers, which look like flying saucers, uh, uh, saucers many of the larger cities, I saw it in Kazan, I saw it in Krasnodar, I saw it in, in Chelyabits. So each had one of these funny little things which looked like spaceships, you know. Uh, but this thing is unique. This thing is unique. And if you drive in Yekaterinburg, uh, I think what I enjoyed so much, uh, and I, I find that uh, interesting. This is, of course, designed by, uh, in the communist time, you know, where religion was not a good thing. However, this thing stands there almost 
like a religious symbol. So you are driving a long boulevard, just imagine your Nevsky prospect, and at the end you see the water tower. It, it sounds funny, but isn't that a nice gesture? You know, water. Water is a symbol of life. It's almost religious. Didn't Jesus say, I'm the water of life? So uh, I think it's very interesting, you know, to investigate actually how they celebrated this element uh, of water. And um, now let's carry on in, in this thought. And one question um, arises, of, of course, in general. And we, are, we, we all do it, but we possibly do it not consciously. So if you, have you been to, uh, let's say, is, has anybody been to Rome? Have, uh, have, and have you made any photographs? Yes. Have you made many photographs? Many. <laughs> many photographs. And why did you make so many photographs? Because you wanted to architecture. Yes, you wanted to get this memory to have, that you have been in this place. And I find it, it it's a, in our human nature, isn't it? That we, we want to go to a place that we enrich our memory. That our life gets richer. And at the same time, it has various effects. And um, I try to go through these effects. So, to do these photographs, and I must say I'm somehow grateful personally that it's my fifth time in Russia. And I'm so grateful that I could see these structures. They enrich my memory and they inspire me. That's the reason why I have this talk today. Now, um, I think the built environment, it, we all will easily agree, and it, it seems to be something obvious, obvious I think has a quite a significant importance in various ways. And I want to uh, discover three ways with you together. What you see here um, is an image of my hometown where I was born. I was born in Kempton, in Algoy, in Bavaria. It possibly looks typical for this region. And uh, you've got the Alp, the Alps in the background. And I, I need to turn the question around. Possibly I should. Um, but I carry on as it is. I was extremely proud that I was born in this city. It is one of the oldest cities in Germany. The Romans were there. Actually, the, the, the name Kempton comes from the Latin word Cambodunum. And isn't that great, you know, that you've got such a long-reaching history in your map. However, we moved away um, uh, very soon. Uh, my, my dad died when I was about nine years old and left that behind. And I suffered a lot that we left our hometown behind. And for a very long time, I thought I would love to go back and move back. So, and the, the reason for that is, and in the talk yesterday, uh, in a much smaller audience, of course I asked the people of St. Petersburg, you know, what do you feel about the city? Are you proud that you are from St. Petersburg? Are you proud? Yes. Of course, and why? It's so beautiful. And what is so beautiful? The architecture. So we, we realize, for our self-definition, for how we define ourselves, the built environment plays, in fact, really a quite crucial role. So if you have uh, studied art at the Stiglitz Art Academy, then I think you've got quite a sense of pride, because you know what beautiful spaces are. You know, not just some dodgy shed somewhere. And so it plays a quite a role. So, the sense of identity and belonging is attached to the built environment. You are going home to your flat and you try to make this flat as beautiful as possible. The other element is, uh, just think about your personal dreams. And I find it really so interesting what we dream when we wake up in the night and we are lucky, something stays in our mind and what our brain does, you know, connecting different places, this also relates to what we experience in the built environment. So it is an inspiration of dreams. We come back to this point later. Now, uh, when students arrive in Newcastle, 
And just imagine uh, you to be 16 or 17 or 18, the first time away from your parents. And now the built environment once again plays a role. I always ask the students, the new arrivals, how do you feel about Newcastle? And let's say most of the students say, yes, that's a good place to be because I love the architecture. It makes me proud to be part of it. And I must say, you know, for me, I digested that I, I, I don't want to go back to my hometown. You know, my dad died, all my ancestors are more or less gone uh, from father's side. So there's no reason for me. And uh, However, I still love it, but there's no longing for it. I'm happy to be in Newcastle and to contribute. But I must say, yes, for me, the Newcastle as a town, how it, a city as it's built, plays a role. Now I come to a different aspect of it, um, of, of architecture and uh, uh, of, of the memory. Now I'm not, surely not a scientist. Um, I'm a hands-on man. You know, I understand my profession as an architect. I'm more a craftsman. But, you know, we truly said we are scientists as well. So uh, what we see here left inside is one of these uh, famous um, illustrated uh, um, readings. You know, obviously it's a, it's a, a piece of the Bible. But I think it is a chapter of the uh, uh, letters for, to the Romans. And uh, I combine these images to remember. So what I read when I studied uh, about memory, um, a scientific um, section told me that one part of our brain, I don't know whether it's left or right, has to do with the images, and the other part has to do with the language. And now, when we just imagine for a second a, a, a room, a, a church, a space, a museum, a school, and as soon as you switch on this image, you start talking. You explain it to yourself. So it automatically is getting a kind of commun communication in between. And I find that quite fascinating. You know, so language and our visual memory are connected. The point I want to make is the physicality of, of the memory. And uh, does anyone play the piano? Possibly quite some. Um, and it's very interesting, you know, that you, you may not see the uh, image of your note pieces, but you will be able, as soon as you sit at the keyboard, to play it out of your mind. So and that is ingrained, actually, in your muscles. So your muscles know what to do, and I find it very interesting, so not talking about the piano, sometimes I forget one of my many pin codes. So, and I need to get of course, to the keyboard, and then it works. If I go away from the keyboard, I forget what, what, the, what it is. So, and I'll give you another example where I find it so remarkable. And that is, um, when I started architecture, everything was by hand, hand drawing. And in the first five years in my uh, career, um, I did everything by hand. And when I went on site, I did know this space is approximately 10.8 meters long, uh, the ceiling is uh, 3, 3 meter 20, the door is 1.5 meter. I did nearly know all measures out of my mind. And the reason is because my hand has done it. So I went the 10.8 centimeters and so on. It was ingrained in my body. And I find that is very remarkable because uh, if you look at the other image, right hand side, I'm not sure how deep our memories are in parts today. You know, when I moved on to card design, I must say I lost a lot of this awareness for space and size. Now, uh, we move on in, in these thoughts about memory. And a famous um, uh, philosopher, French philosopher, um, uh, wrote a very interesting book, it is uh, called The Poetry of Space. Uh, it is Gaston Bachelard. Uh, it's not easy to read in parts, but what, what, what it is about basically is how many imaginations 
relate to our home, to our house, to our flat. And um, now inspired by this idea that the house or our flat is a container of memories, what I tried on the bus last week, I tried to remember the flat in Kempton where I was born. So of course this is not exactly how it went when I was born, I already was a little bit older so that I keep the memory. You see also how bad the roads are in Newcastle because my line is a bit shaky. Um, however, let's say most of the spaces I still have very good in mind. And uh, they were the odd furniture item where I struggled a little bit. But um, also at the same time, I remember so many things which should relate to it. For example, um, when my mother went up to hang up the washing under the loft, and I found the loft space really strange. It was a different environment, it had a different smell, it was very dusty. Or when my dad came home from work and asked me, Thomas, go in the cellar and bring me a bottle of beer. And I was so worried and so scared, you know, because I had a lot of imagination about these spaces. And um, now, if you look at this here, that is a wardrobe. Uh, does that remember you of anything in view to imagination? A wardrobe. You open, there's a lot of clothing and you can get in. And you go to Narnia. Uh, so that is C.S. Lewis, obviously. This is the wardrobe out of the C.S. Lewis Museum. Now, much of the literature has these links, you know. It describes different spaces and places based on memory. I'm jumping a little bit. What we see here is not necessarily a wardrobe. But it's also a building which triggers my imagination. It has a, has a very special history. It's one of the last existing merchant houses in Krasnodar. And my host asked me to come along and to look at it. And it has special features. I don't, I'm not too familiar with the styles you know, of this region. But it felt very special. The unfortunate thing is that the owner is unknown. And now the destiny of this building is also unknown because we don't know who it owns. It's very difficult actually to maintain it and keep it. Now a further aspect is of course the city as a place of shared memories. And um, possibly um, we also realize um, that the, these shared memories, actually, they help us to understand one another. So if you talk about, for example, about St. Petersburg, uh, I may have a certain understanding for some of the elements because I also share a part of your memory. And that connects us. It's a very interesting aspect. So, and therefore, I think um, enriching your memory is a very, very important thing in our social society. Now, looking on this image, that is a satellite image of uh, London at night, and it inspired me to actually to link it to something which is totally different, um, actually to a brain cell, which keeps memory. And this just supports Gaston Bachelard's um, um, saying that a house is a container for memory. So what we see here is the infrastructure, we see the many streets, and we see possibly in between these buildings, and you easily, we can compare this uh, really physically, you know, the memory cells and then the neurons which connect the various memory cells. Uh, yes, um, there is this one, difficult to guess. That is a beautiful sunset in St. Petersburg just two days ago. And I'm told that I'm very lucky if you to the better uh, we have. So uh, I, I, I've chosen these two images. They are not very professional, but I've chosen these images because the ones amongst us who have seen this beautiful sunset, we have this shared memory. You know how beautiful your city is in the warm light in the night, in the evening. I want to move on now to a subject which is 
now more challenging. And that is actually the subject I want to conclude. I, I, I won't go through all slides. Uh, do you know what that is? Yes. <laughs> any, any idea? Any, is it a supermarket? No. <laughs> uh, a station? Um, uh, it is a kind of a station, and you could also say it's a kind of a supermarket. <laughs> it is one of these things which, you know, if you are from my nationality, you don't like very much. If you go on holiday, in particular in France. This is a German submarine bunker. And this is the city of Saint-Nazaire, uh, South Brittany. And it's always painful when you sit in these tourist boats and they say, yes, uh, you know, the German suffering bunkers and build that and, and so on. So it gives you always, then I talk, of course, English. Um, however, now the problem with this particular building is it is too expensive to remove it. Um, it is a massive structure and so necessary and many uh, uh, French regions decided actually to keep this memory. And I find, Forget about cost, I find that uh, quite courageous. Because if you ever travel to saint this thing sits like a big cloud over the city. So you see it everywhere. So, however, there's a new plaza, nicely arranged. Um, but this is now a big question. How should we deal with memories which are not so good in our built environment? And I think you've got also architecture where you sometimes may have doubts, should we really keep it? Is it worth keeping it? Now I think there's a uniqueness to it and the question of uniqueness, I guess, is for our memory extremely important. So we, we could talk actually about a, a kind of a trauma and how do we deal with trauma architecture. And uh, this becomes actually a very cru crucial question. If you Think about the news just recently uh, of the retake of P Palmyra and the discussion, you know, what's happening that, you know, ISIS uh, just blasts up one uh, uh, um, ancient mosque after the other or one monument after the other. This is, of course, a destruction of memory. And after the Second World War, there was a discussion triggered by uh, uh, a Jewish advisor who actually ruled out some of the uh, laws for the United Nations about uh, genocide. One part uh, of his outline was about the people. So, of course, if you suppress the people, if you make them the life not worthwhile, uh, if you kill them, that is, of course, genocide. But he had another definition, and that's a very interesting one, that the destruction of the memory, of the built memory, is also a kind of a genocide. I think it's a very... Uh, touching and very moving and very interesting thought. And interestingly, in this period, 1948, the US rejected it. China rejected it. So it's, it's a critical question, you know, what, what's happening? And is it worth, for example, defending these uh, uh, memories? I don't have an answer to it, by the way. You know, my research is not that deep and far that I could say I could give a direction. Uh, however, I think it is exciting and uh, possibly worth really considering um, these uh, aspects. Left hand side we see a famous bridge. Does anybody know this bridge? That is Mostar in Bosnia and that is during the Bosnian War. Why I have chosen this image, one of my colleagues on the program, uh, it's he, he's our youngest member, uh, I employed him in January and he is from Bosnia. And he experienced as a child the civil war. And he said it was a very traumatic experience. So as a child, eight, nine years old, he did see how the buildings are getting blasted to pieces. Now, not just the buildings. Mostar was possibly totally unique. It had the highest degree of mixed marriages in Europe. 60% mixed marriages between Christians, Islam, Catholics, and so on was a very peaceful, multicultural city. And the bridge was more or less a kind of a symbol for that. And now what the uh, uh, Croatian army did, they blasted it, you know, they destroyed this bridge. Now the big question is, now there's peace, and what uh, Smajo is the name of my colleague told me, they are rebuilding many things exactly like it was, 
and they try to delete any traces of the wall so that it doesn't appear that there ever has been a wall. And now this is a critical question, how we should, should deal with it. And um, now that's the bridge, how it appears today. I've chucked got this quote here uh, from one of the uh, Serb uh, generals uh, about one city which once had 60 mosques. So what they did actually, they blasted all and they took the gravel away and totally deleted all traces. And now what he does is basically rewriting the history. So there never has been a mosque in Svornik. Uh, it is in a very good book uh, called The uh, Destruction of Memory. Now in this book, which inspired me in part for this talk, uh, the, it starts with a, with a definition what war also is. It's not just the killing, but war is basically also the destruction of memory. Now I want to come to a way how could we deal with this kind of traumatic experiences. I, th I think it's difficult, you know, as humankind, uh, as cultivated nations, as people who try to understand one another, how should we deal? Should, should we really, after such a period, uh, remove all traces of it and really forget the bad memory? I think it's a very interesting question. And um, I, I find now in, in my native nation, um, of course, they had quite some load to bear. Um, I think some of their approach is quite remarkable. What we see here is obviously a section of the Reichstag, uh, the German government in Berlin, the government building. And you all know the images possibly, you know, with the uh, Soviet flag over it. And um, we, you also may remember how destroyed and damaged it was. Now, I, I find it a very interesting piece to consider the memory. Um, and there's a very interesting talk with Norman Foster, the architect. Uh, Norman Foster is a very uh, solid um, um, British architectural firm. And they consciously decided, after discussion with the government, to keep actually the graffiti of the Russian soldiers, to keep the bullet holes, to tell the whole story and not just to wipe over it and make it just nice again. And personally, I think sometimes if you think about your personal life, and I know this is a very touching and delicate question, sometimes you also could ask yourself, do I know what a nice day is if I do not know what a bad day is? Do I appreciate the sunshine if I haven't seen any night? So in some ways, actually you need something which shows you that there is variation and that makes you appreciate things more. And similarly, I think this is an excellent reminder to appreciate what we've got today. I very often say, and it's now my fifth time, and I say it again, 30 years ago, of course, I never would have imagined to be here, you know, here on the day bar, you know, I see it over there. It's just amazing, you know, but we get used to it so easily. So I think this is a very nice example. And uh, so Norman Foster, in his speech about this building, he said, what they wanted to do, to now really give this building, as it says here, back to the German people. When it was built, it was a Kaiser building, an imperialistic building. It was not really for the German people. But this time, that was the proposal of the architects, it should be given to the people. So, what we, we had the definition that war is possibly the destruction of memory. But I think we can reverse this. Uh, peace is possibly when we are reconciled with our memory. And I think, let's say, as, uh, if you just are a little bit in psychology or so, I think there's a lot of truth in it. So we are in peace with ourselves if the memories are digested and if we are clean, you know, and actually happy with how it is. You know, I just touch back on the experience when my dad died. Not a nice memory. I very much understood, understand and see it still when I stood in front of the grave. Not a nice memory. But I'm grateful for it because it tells me how good it is 
to have parents and that I had a dad for nine years. No, that's a little bit touching and emotional, sorry about that. Um, but you see, I can easily talk about it, so uh, signaling with that um, the, the digestive memory. Now finally, I, I think I want to conclude now with, with this slide. Um, and a very interesting quote from an uh, interesting um, artist. Anselm Kiefer is a very successful sculptor and painter in Germany. And it's worth uh, um, noting this name. You know, he is internationally well known. And he created this quote, Ruins for me are the symbols of a new beginning. So what you see left hand side, obviously that's Cologne. Another church in rubble, built in the 13th century. Then Gottfried Böhm, a brutalist architect, there was not much money after the war, he built a small chapel with part of the ruins. And then later, uh, in this building by Peter Sumto, a Swiss architect, is everything united. The Gottfried Böhm chapel, the medieval traces, and overall a new future. And I think, find this once again a very interesting way of dealing with memory and fragments. I think I want to conclude the talk here now. You know, there are a few more slides, but I think it is a lot to digest, to think about. And I want you also to give you the opportunity, if you want to make any contribution, or if you have any questions. So it's now free for you if you want to contribute anything to this, these ideas, or if you have a question, please feel free to ask. I talked a lot today, so I'm, I'm happy if I don't speak. Друзья, есть у кого-то вопросы? По-русски, по-английски, неважно. Okay. If there are no questions, then I, I want to uh, give you my my text. Is there one? Is there one? Okay. So how to combine uh, this conservative attitude to architecture and uh, own history uh, with um, progress, with uh, improving of uh, environment, with improving of architecture and uh, new landscape of the city? So how to combine two of these opposite sides of uh, every city? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the question is, if you are in such an environment with so much historic uh, structure, how should you deal with it? You know, is there any chance? For it's a very, very important question, because sometimes, if you just think back about Ekaterinburg, of course, the memory can be in the way of further development. So it can obstruct that something can new can grow. And it's a very, very difficult and uh, question. I, I think this is of course something to convert. Con I can't pronounce it. Con the con. Yeah. No, no, converse, no conversation. So it's the, the guys who are doing the list, you know, I've got a heavy tongue, sorry about that. Conservation? Conservation, thank you. <laughs> yes, um, so the conservationists to in investigate it. But I think it is something where we all should be involved, shouldn't be, you know, to, to have a say. Um, one little example in Stuttgart. Uh, was a very big project in the center, and they are now finally getting the final stages, called Stuttgart 21. And, um, and it was a, a, develop, a radical development. So some trees planted 300 years ago had to, to go. Uh, there are not many trees, you know, that old in the city. Parts of uh, a beautiful listed station had to be to demolished to make place for new development. And it was not very well conveyed to the people. And it gave massive protests. Hundreds of thousands of people went on the street protesting against it whilst it was already under construction. That emphasizes the, uh, how, how urgent this question is. I think it is a lot about good communication. Uh, so one is that we really try to resolve and contribute to it and not shy away. The second question is, uh, uh, once again, how do we pronounce it correctly? Con Conservation. Conservationists. So, um, the question of uniqueness, how unique is a structure, or do we have 
uh, 100 white towers of Katerinburg. If, if there's only <coughs> one, I think this is unique, even if it's not nice. So I think this is possibly an indicator which helps us to a certain degree. And I show you one other little example in this context. Yeah, that is this one. What you see here, left-hand side, is a building brand new 1963. This was the only other branch of the famous Bank of England in, on the island. And that was in Newcastle. A smaller city had a Bank of England. Now, unfortunately, it was not too much appreciated because it has an odd shape. But it was not that bad. However, it was neglected and meanwhile it is demolished. It's gone. The Bank of England of Newcastle building is gone. It was a unique building. And I find it a shame. It is not a nice structure, but you know, niceness and beauty is a different matter. And not necessarily you need to keep everything which is nice. If you have 100,000 nice things, um, you know, how unique are they? So back to your question, I think I try to hint a bit. It is something which needs, of course, a lot of communication and con uh, uh, conversation. <laughs> and, of course, research on is this really elemental to keep it. I was involved in a very interesting project in our city and probably I also want to know your opinion about this project. When you fly in our city, do you like what's now there? You mean on the approach, so if you fly to Pulkovo? Yes, you uh, see two buildings. First one is the old one, Constructivist 1973, and another one is the new one, designed by uh, Sir Richard Grimshaw. Grimshaw and Partners. Is that on the airport itself? Yeah. What's your opinion? Um, I haven't looked at the buildings uh, carefully enough to give a good, good statement on it. You know, and I think it's important to be honest. You know, I don't want to judge something I can't. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. You know, if that is, once again, I, I think the Grimshaw building, the new one, uh, is, is that built by an Italian company at the uh, end? It's a combination of Turkish and Italian but yeah. mostly it was built by uh, British, managed by Russians. Yeah. So it's difficult to judge. Now, from my perspective, uh, the new build, I just comment on the new build. It's not a bad architecture. Uh, let's say I had the joy to wait four hours on my luggage, so I enjoyed this building one go four hours. And I didn't get my luggage, unfortunately, after four hours. I had to fill out four forms. And because I was so tired, and you already uh, realized that he can't talk properly, and sometimes I can't write properly, so I had to fill out the form three times. <laughs> okay, um, so to, to try to give a clearer answer, I think, once again, you need to look on the quality of this constructivist building. Is, is this really, uh, is there uniqueness, is there something which is different to others? Is there, is there quality in it? If, if that's the case, then of course it would be a shame if it has to go. Okay, so uh, I'd like to present uh, what was done actually. It was a constructivism building designed by a very famous architect, uh, Zhuk. Mm -hmm. And for the city it was a real symbol because it was the uh, uh, first building uh, in our team was involved, involved several architects of like 55, 60 years old at the time. And they told for them it was a symbol, it was the first uh, new building, one of the first uh, constructed at the time with a new style. And from the city center they went by bus there just to drink a cup of coffee, to feel something new that came to our city. So uh, for this generation it's real memory. And uh, now when we uh, did this uh, concert, I was involved with the concert. Uh, people had really tough negotiations because uh, we also had Germans because they had parade in the airport. And uh, some had opinion that airport is, should be just like a bus station, it should function. Mm -hmm. And you are right that not everything is perfectly functioning. Mm -hmm. And in terms of architectural thing, even a casual user say 
some not optimal things, but not uh, this is important. I think that what was done, it was important symbol for some for some generation. Uh, it also constructs with my architecture that important to preserve in somehow in our city. And uh, what Grimshaw did, uh, he adopted his design, uh, what was uh, quite close to what was done in the past, but also for us it became a symbol of something new. So, because we do not have so many buildings designed by stars now in our city, and it's one of the buildings done by stars. And uh, to answer the question of previous. Uh, Speaker, I would say is that it's good to, to do something new, but it's good if it would be a symbol and symbol for some generation. Okay, thank you for your contribution. Any other comments or questions? Um, yeah. As a European that's a frequent visitor in uh, St. Petersburg, do you think that the city lacks any contemporary architectural elements to truly be uh, considered a global modern city? <laughs> it's, I, I think, is it really necessary having contemporary architecture in every city? Does every city need a Frank Gehry? Does every city need Sarah Hadid? Does every city need Norman Foster? No. No. <laughs> and I think, you know, it gives your city possibly uniqueness that that's not the case. And you, you can also, you know, if you look at Paris, for example, let's say the, the Haussmann Center, um, which was, of course, questionable how it came to it, but nevertheless, it creates Paris as we see it today. You know, and in this center area, it is not allowed, actually, to, to do such things. For good reason, you can do it elsewhere. And I think it gives your city, of course, a lot of uniqueness. And I personally, I don't know, um, of course, we live in a, in a more global culture, and architecture possibly always had, but even more so with the media today. You know, we've got these celebrity architects, and um, one of my students uh, from Baku, he came, uh, do you know, we have from Gary, the flame towers, and now we get Saha Hadid as well. Is this really a quality? I don't know, you know. It, or is it like saying, I've got a Porsche and I've got a Mercedes, or a Jaguar? So I think it's a bit, let's say, in view to ethic and moral, I don't know, questionable from my perspective. And I would say, I don't know, what St. Petersburg needs, needs sensitivity and really good architects, whatever name they have. Any other comments, questions? Or should we conclude? So I, I think I, I, are you okay if I come to a conclusion? So once again, I'm, I'm very, very happy that I could share this moment with you, a unique moment, I hope. So we have a shared memory now, we are somehow connected. Um, I thank you for your attention, for your patience to be here tonight, and I wish you all the best in the future, and thanks again. Спасибо всем большое, друзья, за то, что вы пришли. Мы надеемся, что э, формат вам понравился, и мы с вами еще будем видеться дальше. А еще раз напомню, что 14 апреля в Доме архитектора э, пройдет встреча с Винсом Хейблом. Винс Хейбл – экономист, э, бывший министр экономики и образования Великобритании. Будет очень интересно, мы вас всех ждем. И обо всем читайте, пожалуйста, в Фейсбуке. И скоро у нас будет потрясающий сайт. Эта встреча будет тоже в 19.00. И мы будем максимально распространять информацию. Я уверена, что вы ее обязательно увидите. Спасибо еще раз всем большое.